of scleroderma, and I have the systemic form of scleroderma, which means that it affects my internal organs as well as my outer skin. My name is Logan Sigtish. I am 18 years old, and I have scleroderma. When I was diagnosed, I was 12 years old. Uh, for, for me, I was not diagnosed right away. I started uh, the process of trying to find out what was wrong with me. Um, so I was in sixth grade. I was running track, and I, ha I had been a very excellent runner before, uh, running uh, faster times than uh, most of the kids my age. And then come track season, I could barely do like um, an 800 run without being beaten by like a fourth grader. It was like, what in the world is going on? I have no energy, I have no muscle. I am Mary Mont, and um, I have scleroderma, and I'm very fortunate that it's not in my organs. Some people go for years not knowing what, what it is. It is. Because it's not an easy dis disease to diagnose, they call it the designer's disease because everybody is different when you have an autoimmune disease, and especially scleroderma. I think when she was, when Chris was in junior high, she started having a lot of issues, and she did have a, an emergency surgery at one point. And the doctors a lot uh, with weird ailments. Um, waking up in the middle of the night with tightening uh, in the chest area. Uh, my hands would turn blue at different times. Uh, because I was so young, they weren't checking me for an autoimmune disease. They, they just thought that I was having panic attacks or something with my hormones wasn't right. I started to know something was wrong when, in the spring of 2004, when I was uh, just new at school, something just didn't feel right, and then in the spring of 2005, I grew very sick. I was violently ill, and no one could understand why. Uh, so after nine months of going from doctor to doctor, I eventually landed up with rheumatology diagnosed with scleroderma and in the December of 2005. Scleroderma is an autoimmune disease that's very much like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, sclero means skin, so it's a skin illness. It uh, tightens the skin and it can also affect your internal organs as well. Where, where it tightens like your esophagus or your lungs. Um, it mainly affects women ages 30 to, to 55. But as you've seen earlier, like with Logan and, and others in our group, we do have men and, and children can be affected as well. We don't know the causes of this disease uh, fully. We, we know some clues. There is a, uh, a genetic component, and we know that because if you take a lot of uh, patients with this and then compare it with normals or their uh, brothers and sisters or family members, you can demonstrate that there are some areas of the human genome that is the, our part of our DNA that makes the risk greater. So those are factors that are a cause, but it's not as strongly linked with the genes as conditions that people are often familiar with to think, think about as a genetic disorder. But in most patients with scleroderma, we really don't have a clue from a practical uh, perspective. It pretty much is a designer's disease, which makes it that much more difficult to diagnose. I can get symptoms even now, and like in a month, then they'll be gone and then another one will come back 
it's just like a hit and miss. There was, there was a lack of knowledge of what was going on. I, I went into the doctor's office for about a year off and on, probably once a month, complaining of tightening in the chest. And they sent me to a rheumatologist. And probably within two weeks, I was diagnosed with scleroderma, and then they knew right away that I had the systemic form. That was the first time we ever heard of that's the word scleroderma, I had no idea what it was. Uh, I remember that day uh, very, very clearly, very vivid. It was uh, um, just sitting in the, uh, the doctor's office and they were, they were trying to be nice. And to me, it was like, I'm 12, I don't, I don't really understand what you're saying. Uh, but my, I knew my parents were upset about something I, and uh, they said, you have scleroderma. To a 12-year-old, I said, great, what's scleroderma? It, it's weird how clearly I remember that day. Uh, Dr. Offlinger is her name, and, and she was so kind. And I went in, and there, there was no judgment about the fact that I was uh, having panic attacks. I felt really calm. And she explained to me what I had very clearly. Uh, and I was terrified inside. <laughs> Everything kind of got cloudy a little bit because I heard this word that I couldn't pronounce. On one end, it was it was scary. On another end, I had a name for for what it was that I was fighting. And I realized I wasn't crazy. And I had family that was around and a doctor that understood. And I felt safer in some ways, and, and I was scared because they thought, you know, maybe four or five years max at that time was kind of my diagnosis. Um, when scleroderma involves the internal organs, uh, depending upon what the pattern of involvement and uh, how severe it is, it can be deadly, and sometimes people can die from the scleroderma, sadly. Because we can be self-conscious, or I've been self-conscious in the beginning about how my face looks sideways, because of your, you have tightening around your lips and stuff, and before it was even a little more than it is now. So I used to think that people were always staring at me <laughs> when we'd stop the car or something. So I'd cover my mouth up with a towel or with my hand, and I uh, became a habit. I didn't even know I was doing it. And uh, someone in a car next time asked if I was okay, if I needed anything, because they thought I was like coughing or bleeding or something because the towel was up there. <laughs> I explained, no, I'm fine. So it's almost worse to try to cover up something that nobody is, nobody cares about when they're driving. They're not staring at people. <laughs> How do we treat this disorder? And I, I, th I think you can break that down in a sense into the three different parts of the disease. And we have, I would say, good treatments for the blood supply problem. When someone has Raynaud's phenomenon and their bloods go into spasm. When it comes to the inflammation part and the autoimmunity, we have a range of treatments for that. Those include drugs like uh, prednisone or corticosteroids that basically knock down inflammation anywhere in the body but have potentially long side effects, severe side effects when used for a long period of time. And uh, drugs like cyclophosphamide or cytoxan is the brand name that we think about mainly to treat cancers but also is used to treat autoimmune diseases. And by knocking down the immune system, it gets rid of some of the inflammation. And that works quite well while people take it. But it doesn't, we, we can't use so much as to totally knock down the inflammation because then it makes somebody vulnerable to infection. So that's always a balancing act. Do we suppress the immune system and make people vulnerable to infection? 
or do we uh, sort of suffer from the inflammation and the autoimmunity? It's scary. It's you're kind of signing your life away to these people. They tell you they have to tell you all the bad stuff before they tell you any of the good stuff in in a room. And they're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> here it is in a nutshell. And they get pretty graphic about what could happen. And, and then you just kind of have to say, oh, kind of have to put your life in their hands and, and so trust. What made you make that decision? I, I definitely wavered a bunch before, and but I kind of just had to think that this was the best option for my life, and, and I definitely wanted to fight the disease more than just sit idle. I decided that my life could be better served for others as well as myself, that better fighting it and trying this experiment. When I was first diagnosed, I, in a sense, I kind of gave up. I just let, it, in my um, thought process, when I was 12, I, I thought, all right, just throw the medicines on. I'll just take whatever. I'll, I'll do whatever you say. Now, it, at 18 years old, it's like, I no, I don't want that kind of medicine. Or, no, I, I'm not going to do that, because that seems more harmful to do that. They said I couldn't run, and now I'm... I'm doing college cross country, so it's like I'm, I'm kind of not rebelling, but it's like, well, that you can take a different standpoint, and now I understand that there are other options than just heavy medication and just going, just sitting back and letting it all happen. So my family doctor did a great job. Within a month, he he said you need to go see doctor first at. Virginia Mason. So with the two of them, I got, you know, received the treatment I should right away. It took a while, though, to work, a couple of years. My body, you know, changed again after the transplant, and my skin softened after a year. Um, and I had a life again. It was like immediately when you're able to have the apparatuses out of you, all of a sudden you're not, you're not stuck at home as much, being hooked up to feedings or carrying around a backpack with food going in you. Um, life just kind of slowly starts to become more normal again. Normal, whatever that is. It is very crazy. It's crazy to say it now because I feel so much, I feel so normal now, comparative. So I don't feel like scleroderma has such a hold on my life that it did. She's been very positive and has a very good sense of humor. We've done a lot of laughing through, through all of this, yeah. And she's always maintained hope. Yeah, she's yeah. been amazing and kind of an inspiration to all of us. Yeah. And a cure would be wonderful. Uh, the stem cell transplants and the medications and stuff can stop it to a degree, but it doesn't cure it. Um, and it isn't really a remission that it goes into, but it can prevent it from progressing. Uh, we are grateful for, for donations, we're grateful for the support. Uh, all of it is really aimed at trying to figure out how to uh, understand this disorder, how to measure it better, ultimately how to treat it and potentially even cure it.